So, hello everyone. Uh, nice to see you. I am, my name is Stéphane Pardo. I work for uh, Red Hat on the Quarkus project and the Vertex projects. And today I'm going to present what Quarkus is and why we call it uh, super, Supersonic Subatomic Java. Well, this is a catchy tagline, but we'll explain during the talk exactly why, uh, why we say this. Um, and this is a presentation that was uh, written by Emmanuel Bernard, so I have to give him credit for it. So first, what is Quarkus? It's an open source project. It's a stack that you use to write Java applications. And even though you can create monoliths with it, we focus on a really different sort of applications. Well, we focus on, on solving three cases of applications. We wanted to support monolith, but we also want to support from the start what we call cloud native applications, uh, you know, where we focus and uh, optimize on, uh, you get orchestration uh, that deals with deployments and scaling fell over, all of this is automated. Uh, you can deploy on platforms such as whatever, hybrid clouds, uh, OpenShift, whatever else. Uh, if you write 12 fact factor apps, microservices, um, this is something that we want to, to focus on. So. Um, and, and it's very different writing a monolith and writing a microservice. So the architecture is obviously different as well because they, they have very different application density. Uh, the communication patterns are different between the, the microservices as well. You likely have a lot of even driven development as well. And so we focus on, on a lot of areas that monolith don't focus on. And we also want to make sure that this is technology that is suitable for serverless as well. And serverless, um, it's uh, obviously, everybody laughs at the term, it's not, it has servers, right? But the difference between microservice and serverless is that uh, microservices, you make the microservices scale, but the, your, your service is mostly always up, at least you get only, you get at least one up all the time. Uh, for serverless, you get functions and they get shut down all the way to zero. So you have literally nothing running on the cloud unless you get a request and then at the last second it started up and it fires up your, your function, and you pay by chunks of 100 milliseconds or whatever. So if your function takes a second to start, then you're doing it wrong. You're, you, this is not something that you can use. All right, so we focus on this as well. Um, before I can, let me go back to, oh, I had this place before. Before I can talk to you about what this is, I'm going to switch back to mirror and do a demo, because this will be easier to explain what Quarkus is. So, we have it, all right. So if you wanna start writing an application in Quarkus, uh, one of the first things you can do is go to code.quarkus.io and then you can get the option to create an application for Quarkus. We'll call this one Lunatic demo. Um, you can get your application built with Maven or Cradle, and you get lots of extensions. Um, at the core, an application is just a, you know any regular Java application. Uh, all the Quarkus uh, core is a small thing, and then you get extensions for each bits and pieces that you want to add. So you get options like well, by default you have everything supported for making REST endpoints. Uh, but you have validation, you have um, serli uh, you have data access, like um, uh, storing entities to hibernate, uh, lots of JDBC drivers, we get asynchronous uh, database drivers as well, provided by Vertex, uh, we get MongoDB, uh, lots of uh, messaging support from Smorai, uh, lots of reactive support from Vertex as well, um, we get f support for uh, deploying functions on, on Lambda, on Azure, um, security options for Keycloak or managing security yourself in files, JPA, whatever. We get lots of integration with Camel, so if that's your thing, we got you covered. Um, Jules has uh, support in the form of Cogito, uh, where you can use the, the Jules engine, um, especially built really fast with uh, Quarkus and support for Kotlin, Scala, whatever fancy you want. Okay, so we're going to, the application we're going to do is going to be a, a to-do app, and we're going to focus on supporting, um, I need, I'm going to need JSONB, I'm going to store stuff in Hibernate, 
uh, with Panache. I'll explain what this does. I'm going to store everything in JDBC, and oh, and I'm going to what's the last thing? I want to show Open API endpoints. So I select the extensions, but those are just you know imports in your POM or whatever. Um, this is a nice way to get the demo. I get click on generate. I extract this in my folder here, which already has lots of junk. Okay, and then I can go to my IDE, but obviously I'm using Eclipse here, but most people are using IntelliJ, so that just works just as well. And I import my project and have my projects here. So, you know, not much. As I said, all the extensions I picked are here, end up in as imports as modules in the POM. Um, my application has an example class. So this is the uh, the hello endpoint. Can everybody see or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. So it's just JAX-RS, it's very boring. It says this is going to be on the hello path and it serves the get method and it produces plain text and you get hello. Um, this is this is pretty much the sum of the application, the POM and this. And now let's try to run it. Here, how do I run this? I run Quarkus in dev mode. This will fire up Quarkus, it will compile the classes, it will fire up Quarkus in a special mode where it does support a hot reload. It's, it looks at for all the classes that change. And here, it tells me, okay, it started here. This is my application, and I know I have the hello endpoint here. It says hello, and I think, okay, well, this is not good enough. I want to say hello lunatic, so I save, go back here, hit reload, I get lunatic. Um, this is, if we go back to the console, it, so it started in this, and it, it took, yeah, it took 500 milliseconds to restart the, the server. So we focus a lot on startup time, and, and here we're not reload, we're doing, we're not doing hot reload of one class. We're reloading the entire application. Uh, this is a small application, so of course it goes fast. But, uh, the way it works, it, it really scales well, and we focus on even, even normal applications start really fast. Um, you get also good feedback, you know, if you mess up and you have a compilation error, so you also get yeah, feedback saying exactly what went wrong. Um, I'm going to reset it to this because we have tests here that check that this runs exactly like this. So if I run the test, we have support for, for Quarkus. It starts the server um, for every bunch of tests. And when you test, you do testing, you have the full server. You don't even need to mock anything and have parts of it. Uh, only parts of it started. Um, the other thing is that we have also support for compi compiling natively, which I will talk about later, and running uh, the same taste test, but running, if the backend is running on, the, on a native image, compiled as an executable, it just means adding another test class and saying, I want to reuse this test. Here I extend the other test, and I want to run it against the native image instead of just running on the JVM. So, you know, whenever you choose to compile natively otherwise, after, after, afterwards, you can also test your application exactly the same way. So, let's go and build a to-do app now. Everything here is at, no, it's not at API, it's where I'm going to do it. Okay, you see, I have a first problem, I have a 404, and it's trying to, it's trying to help me a bit. It tells me these are the rest resources I have, and these are the static files that I have, and this is the one I want. Okay, so, it's trying to be helpful to developers. Uh, what can I see here? I have, I try to load all the to-dos, I get nothing, I have a 404. Okay, so let's implement the backend now. Go back here. What I want to do, I want a class. I'm going to call it to-dos for my controller. I want it to sit at API. And it's going to produce media type application JSON and consumes it as well. So if we if we get there. 
uh, I want a get method that returns the list of to-do entities that will store in the database. It's my method name. And now I need to return the list of to-dos, right? Um, for this, I need to create the class. And if you're familiar with Hibernate, how many people are familiar with Hibernate here? Normal JPA here. Um, I declare my entity. And, but we are using Hibernate with a twist. How many people are familiar with Play1? Play Framework 1? No, a few. Uh, we have almost the same setup now. So if you say extends panache entity, then you have an entity where you can declare all the public, all the fields, uh, instead of doing getters and setters, etc. you do public string title, public string URL. Uh, we need something to give the order, except this is also regular Hibernate in the sense that order is a reserved SQL uh, keyword, so we can't name it that. We need to say the column will, will be called ordering, and we have one for completed. This is the API that the UI expects. So this is, these are going to all end up as columns in the database. And because I extend panache entity, I have magic methods. Like I can list them all. And I can, I'm going to sort them by title. All right. So this is my endpoint. Let's go back here and try it. Okay, it didn't work. Now why? Because, well, I said I want to use an entity, but I, at no place did I say where I want to store it. Okay, so I do, you know, Quarkus has lots of configuration by default, um, and we also store all the configuration in the same file, so we have centralized configuration. You don't need to, to configure a persistence XML or whatever, or even logging, everything goes in the same file. I do need to tell it where the URL of the database is, what driver it's using, which username, passwords. And I want to generate the, the data. So let's go back here, hit reload, and now it works. Well, it's still empty, though, but you can see that cycle, development feedback cycle is pretty good because we don't need to go back and compile and run Maven or whatever. Uh, it picks up everything it recovers from all the errors. So now I'm going to create a file here called imported SQL where I'll put my initial data, which is here. I want to see that I'm going to type this in, obviously. This is my initial data. I go back here, I hit reload, and there you go. I have stuff. I have my project. Now, if I want to continue the experiment, I say, oh, clear completed. I want to support this. Okay, that's the, I need another endpoint here. Obviously, I would not put those classes here. I would put them in different packages, but for the demo, that's, that's fine. So I want a delete method. It doesn't do anything, and it clears completed. Now, I could put the logic here, but by convention, we like putting the logic in, in, uh, in separate um, classes, in the entity class. So I'm going to call delete completed here. So I create the method. Three small, so, okay. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, I'm going to call delete with a query and I want everything that is completed set to true, I'm going to delete it. Uh, this is, again, if you're familiar with play one, you'll, you'll know how this works. This is a shortcut uh, for saying completed equals, if you only match for a where close, yeah, question mark one, you can add more close and it's the where close, and if you start with select or order or whatever, then you get the full JPA stuff. So I'm going to clear all of them that are completed Make sure that I save my endpoints. Oh, and I'm doing database modification, so this needs to be in a transaction. And I can go back here, no, here, and say clear completed. And now it worked, and I got rid of the completed stuff. Now I want to add something. All right, this is something that will take also something transactional, but I want the post method, and the contract here is to return the new to-do. 
takes it to do. Persist it. Return to do. It's pretty boring. Come back here. Now, if I press enter, I have it here. So you see the feedback cycle be between, you know, I want to do something and I get, get doing something and I try it out and it works is pretty nice. Now, let's try to do something a bit more complex. Uh, let's say I want to build a sort of a search endpoint and I want something that looks at the path. I have, I want to search by title and I'll want the results paged. So I'll return a list of to-do who match the title and our page, so this is a bit annoying. Title and path param int page. I want to return, uh, I'm, I'm going to put the logic again in my entity, so title page. Go here, so how do I implement this? Um, it's easy, I take, I write a query like before, but you can see that it, you can extend the queries uh, nicely. You can say, I wanna, f I wanna list, so I start with, I want everything that is completed, and I also want the title to be like the first parameter and my first parameter I'm going to make a wildcard and say title at least you know partial match and return this. Do you need the search itself? Yeah, it, it doesn't care that I mistype. Um, so I go back here. Obviously I don't have a UI for this, but this is why I added um, Open API early on. If I go to Swagger UI, then I get my UI. I get all my endpoints. I get the new one. I say I want to try it out. So I didn't do any paging so yet. Back but here, and I say I want. Which ones do I have? Star. Everything that had star should have many results. Yeah, I have them all. Now I want to support paging, and I turn my list into a normal query and then I have a query, I can get the number of results, I can do paging, I can choose to have a stream or whatever, get the, the, the page it by, by page and I can go and say I want a page number this and page size of, well, let's do a page size of three and then I want the result as a list. I go back here, try it again execute, and now I got three results. So you, you can see, you know, there's very good ways to do, uh, get really good feedback and be productive on the application. Now, if we go back here, now what I'm going to do here uh, is that I'm going to package my application and I'm going to package it as both a jar, which you can deploy on any JVM, on any, on the cloud or locally, whatever. But I'm also going to build a native executable. Uh, but this takes a bit of time, so I'm going to show you and come back here later to show you uh, the results of this. All right, so we've seen the demo. Now we're going to focus on why we made Quarkus. So, we talked about microservices, right? And the continuum, when people migrate from a monolith to a microservice, the good the, there's a good chance that you'll get a lot more microservices than you got um, the applications in the monolith. So let's say one monolith you translate it to 20 microservices, okay? Um, and in turn, if you want to, to, to turn those again into functions, then that's going to be a lot more. Uh, so we move we move applications from monolith to microservices and then parts of it to functions as well. It's a continuum. We want to support all three sorts of applications. But the scalability is very different from when you go from bigger process to more instances. Uh, the way you scale is adding more microservices and 
and you want them to be really small. You want them to not have the memory cost and CPU cost that you would have on a monolith because you're on the cloud and you're paying per memory usage. So we want to make sure that those things are really small. And for functions, you also want to make sure that those things are just tiny and pay a fraction of the cost to start. So that's what we focus on. The number of requests, not just per second, but also per megabyte used and per millisecond started because this is a metrics that makes sense to save you money when you're deploying on the cloud. Um, and the other thing is that, let's say you have a 20 a person team working on the monolith, and you move to microservices, there, there's a good chance that you will have, if you have 20 microservices, you will have one developer per, per microservice. You will not get more people to develop your application. So it, you have to be more productive as well. So this is another thing that we focus on. Um, you might be wondering why we go through all this pain, you know, supporting all this. Um, the, the cloud container platforms, they bring you deployment agility and speed. Um, and when it comes to you, deploying one microservice is a pain, but deploying 20 of them, you've already paid the pain once and it scales. So it doesn't cost you more to deploy 40 or 100 microservices because the infrastructure is the same, the learning curve is the same, the tools that you use are the same. So you might as well just deploy as many of them as you can. We might as well uh, abuse that. And this really works for scalability as well because um, if you don't consume more than you need, if you want to scale something, you have a, let's say you have a monolith and part of the monolith doesn't scale, well, the you would have to deploy more of the monolith or boost the machine that runs it. If you have microservices and you figure out that one microservice is the bottleneck and it has, it started with the wrong database type, let's say you started with SQL, you want to move to NoSQL or whatever, uh, you can focus your development time on scaling this monolith, adding more instances or rewriting the application and modifying it. Uh, if you try to move one part of an application uh, in a monolith from, let's say, uh, SQL to NoSQL, the developers are going to say, don't even try it. You know, that's, that's just too much work. Uh, so you get faster business reaction as well because you can only focus, if you have to fix something, you can only focus on the microservice that is at fault. We start those, uh, deploy those, uh, focus on the parts that matter. The problem is that the JVM, you know, it's, it's 25 years old or something. It's probably the age of lunatic, come to think of it. Um, and it was, it was started, and the idea was that you would f focus, you would give, give all the memory that you could to the JVM, and it would be able to use that memory. It would be able to fire up um, a great JIT and improve your application over time, and it goes faster the more you use it. Um, but it needs a lot of memory. And initially you had application servers where you would say, well, use all the memory on this machine and then run all the applications on this VM. And they shared some infrastructure between all the, all the classes, all the, the memory usage, the, the JIT, uh, metadata. They used all of those. They shared all of those. But when we're moving to microservices, the ratio of your application per compared to what the JVM is using to run your application, the ratio becomes bad because you're not sharing all the, uh, between your instance, instances of your microservice, you're not sharing all the metadata from the JIT, from the class, from the reflection between them. So you're paying the cost of memory for each instance. And that really, that really shows when you deploy in the cloud, this is one of the reasons why people moved from uh, the JVM, even though they like Java, they moved from the JVM to Node.js and more and more to go because they are able to scale faster uh, and cheaper on the cloud by having smaller footprints and, and faster startup time. So, but this was before Quarkus. I'm going to focus on four key aspects of Quarkus. The first one, you've seen it already, um, developer joy. This is something that we consider for every decision that goes in the framework. You know, no matter how good we make it, if it's not easy to use, nobody is going to use it. So we make sure that every decision, every new feature has to go through the crib of this and say, is it improving productivity? Is it uh, nice to use? Is it simple? Is it zero conf? You know, we want, we want the config to be minimal to use. You only configure the parts that you actually need and we cannot guess. Uh, we want everything to be also based on standards that a lot of people, um, no, and if the standards are not good enough, we're improving the standards, innovating, and then bringing it back to the standards. As I said, all the configuration is stored in a single file. 
uh, and we want to streamline the code for, for the common usage and then make it possible to do the extra complexity if you need to. And the other thing is we want to make sure that if you choose to compile natively, we make it trivial. So the other thing, let's go back to the tagline. I talked about how it is supersonic, subatomic. The, what we mean by subatomic is the memory usage. If you look at a normal traditional cloud native stack, it's very common that you will start and get more than 100 megs of um, RSS is the uh, memory uh, resident size of memory used in, in, in your uh, VM. Um, you, get, you get more than 100 megs of memory. If you use Quarkus on the JVM, you're already going to have that memory, have of it. Um, and if you go the extra mile and you need to, to compile natively, get even more benefits, then we go like to 12 megs. This suddenly we're comparable and competitive with Go and, and Node.js people. Um, this is just a simple application, a normal, uh, very small service, but if we go through the whole uh, Fatter microservice uh, and have CRUD, the, the same benefits continue, right? So the work we did in reducing memory, it's, only, it's not only for trivial apps, it goes on for, for real apps. The other thing is the supersonic tagline. Supersonic is for speed. Um, if you start a REST application, it's going to start in less than a second. If you have a full CRUD application, again, two seconds max. Compare it to traditional Java applications, they would take way more time, like three times at least. Um, and if you want to go the extra crazy mile, you compile natively, you know, you have functions. And suddenly, as I said, for functions, they need to be below 100 milliseconds. And, and that's exactly where we are. We're talking less than, we're talking tens of milliseconds, right? So, uh, and this works because of ahead of time, everything is compiled before you start. And, and by the way, those are not times to start. Those are time to first response. So we're not talking about starting things with everything delayed initialization, and then the first response is going to be crazy expensive. This is not time to start, time to first response. So everything is warm. Another of the benefits that we focus on for Quarkus is unification of imperative and reactive programming. So whenever we have an API, we work really hard, hard to have the equivalent API in, in blocking style and in reactive style. So, you know, in blocking style, everything is based on having um, a blocking a thread and having a thread pool for your request. And in reactive style, then everything becomes asynchronous. You don't block the, you don't block, you don't need to block any thread. You do async IO, et cetera, and chain everything into pipelines. Um, we can do this because everything is based on Netty and Vertex. So we also, we already get the great ecosystem that Vertex, how many people know Vertex here? Oh, quite, quite a bit of them. Polo, you don't count, you're cheating. <laughs> Cooking the, the numbers. Uh, so, so, you know, we get all, already a great async ecosystem and we make a front end for it and let you use it for, for Quarkus as an alternative to anything um, uh, imperative. And the other thing is that, you know, whenever you want to, well, when you start a new project, it's, it's another thing, but when you, we're starting to see job posting saying, oh, uh, we want to hire people uh, competent in Quarkus and you need five years of experience. But Quarkus is not even one year old, so the, that's a bit hard. But it turns out it's possible because Quarkus doesn't do much at runtime. Most of the APIs that you're going to interact with are already proven standards that are, that have been around for a long time. Yeah, I asked if people knew Hibernate. Yes, they do know Hibernate, you know. So you'll find your, your way around. We have really great pieces there. Um, so how does it work? That's the interesting question. When you start a framework, it's going to do a bunch of things. It's going to be, do a bunch of things that are very <coughs> annoying, like parse the configuration files. And if we're talking about the, the traditional EE thing, you're going to have a persistence.xml file, you're going to have a log, log.xml file, you're going to have something else in YAML, something else in, in JSON, whatever. Uh, the cost of doing this is not just parsing all those files. If you load an XML file, you're also initializing all the bits of the JVM that fire up an XML parser. So you pay that cost, you don't realize it, but that's a cost. It loads a lot of classes just to be able to do this. The same for YAML, the same for everything. So by unifying configuration files, we also make sure that it, it just goes faster. Uh, so there, 
the framework does this, it does then class pass scanning, it looks for all the endpoints that you define, it's going to look at all your classes, even if it's convention of a configuration, whatever, it's going to have to look at your application and figure out how to deploy it. Uh, that's a lot of scanning, annotations, getters, whatever. Then it's going to build all the, all the metadata per framework. So you're going to say exactly how to initialize the logging, how to initialize transactions, how to initialize the, the data sources, how to initialize the REST, etc. Hibernate, all of this needs initialization. And then you're going to prepare reflection, generate proxies at runtime, etc. Then you're going to start IO. So what we do in Quarkus is that we take everything that happens before starting IO and we move it at build time. So Quarkus is a framework to start other frameworks at build time. Um, which benefits do we get? So first, we do the work once, not at each start. If you're deploying your application on the cloud and trying to scale, you don't need to reinitialize your application 100 times for 100 instances. You do it once. You don't need to pay that cost because you pay, you know, the cloud is not free. Um, the other benefit, and this is a virtual circle, is that all the bootstrap classes, they're no, no longer needed at runtime. So I talked about the XML parser, that's a great example. If you do the XML parsing at build time, the runtime image, the jar you're going to produce, is not going to need any XML parser. So first, you're not going to pay the cost, but it's not even going to be present in the memory usage of the JVM. So reduced memory classes that you wouldn't be able to unload otherwise. Uh, so we have less time to start, less memory used, and we also try as much as possible to get rid of reflection. So whenever, I mean, we do a lot of reflection at build time, but then we try to replace it with generated bytecode at runtime that will do everything without reflection. Uh, we work with a closed world assumption. We know the entire application at build time. We can do a lot of optimizations. Um, so the pipeline of Quarkus is mostly this. We compile your application, then you get, uh, you do all the wiring, we do all the augmentation uh, phase at build time, and then you get the choice. Uh, you can produce a JVM image or produce um, native application with Growl. So, by the way, let's go back here. I have, it's really big now. I have my Growl application compiled. It took two minutes. And if I look here, in target, I have the application. Uh, it's lunatic demo. Here I have the runner, that's a native application. That's 63 megs. It includes the entire application with all the, all the dependencies I had and it includes all the bits of the JVM needed to run, and you know, that's, that's a lot smaller than the normal JDK, and if you start it, it started in 68 milliseconds, you know? So, and this is, most of the time spent here during starting is not Quarkus. We went to the database, we inserted a bunch of stuff. So, the 68 milliseconds, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that 60 of them were spent just doing I.O. with the database at startup. So you can see it's really something that scales. You can use a serverless, and, and we're not joking around, okay? Um, will I ever get back my presentation? Wow. I do. Um, so how do we do, um, nat uh, how do we produce native executables? We use the GraalVM native image. How many people have heard of GraalVM here? A lot of people. Okay, GraalVM is a bunch of things. It has a VM, it has Truffle, it has lots of things. And it has one thing called native image. It takes your Java code jar, it produces a native executable. Uh, how many people have tried to use native image here? Okay, how many of those found it easy? Yeah, oh, uh... <laughs> All right, so the, the thing is that normally you take your application, and you try it and it's going to be, it's going to fail. It's going to say, oh, well, actually we don't support this because it's using some special bit inside the JVM, or we don't support this because it's, it's loading a native code from somewhere else, native lib, and you need to, oh, well, I, at runtime I don't have this, it doesn't work because reflection didn't, wasn't set up properly. Um, it's very complicated. So what it does is that um, it looks at your code, it makes a closed world assumption, uh, and it, it, it's going to, to make sure that it compiles it, but the trade-off is that 
and uh, that's a good thing, right? It doesn't load all the reflection about your application. Every, fu every function that you're not going to use, it's not going to be compiled. So you have a lot of dead code elimination. You get rid of all the metadata required for the JIT, because you no longer need to JIT at runtime. Uh, you get rid of all the parts of the JDK that you're never using, so you're really compiling only the code you're using, and, and you're getting uh, a lot of stuff out of your application, which also means that um, you have no arbitrary reflection, so if it doesn't notice that you're going to run some things with reflection at runtime, it, it will fail. You need to tell it, oh, I need those classes to have reflection metadata, and that's what can be complex. Um, and this is something that we fix with Quarkus. So which benefits do you get running GraalVM with Quarkus? First, 100% of the ecosystem supported by Quarkus is supported on GraalVM. So we made sure that all the frameworks that we that you can use with Quarkus with extensions, they work. So that means that we made sure that all the reflection problems were solved, uh, all the native compilation problems were solved. You don't need to pass uh, crazy long JSON metadata or manual command lines to run native image. As, you, as I showed you, you just do package p native and it produces it. That's, we made sure that it's really easy. And we also, um, drive a lot of the gathering of metadata needed by GraalVM because we know how the frameworks work. We know how to help dead code elimination. Like we look at the, 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 um, JDBC driver we're using and we're making sure that all the code path that lead to other dialects, for instance, are removed and, uh, and that GraalVM will never even consider them. So we make sure that we help it uh, reduce the image size. Uh, the question then becomes, when do you use which VM with Quarkus? And that's a, that's a good question. Uh, JVM is fine. 80% of the people that use Quarkus will deploy in the JVM, and that's fine. Uh, you still get memory uh, benefits and startup time benefits with Quarkus, so you're still winning. Um, and also you get the JIT, so after a while your application runs probably faster than if you do a head of type compilation. Um, you get great monitoring tools, uh, it's Java so everything will work. And, and if you have libraries that only work with the, with the standard JDK, that's where you will, this is where you will want to go. Now, if you have the highest, highest memory density requirements, if you want to scale and pay, you know, if you want functions, obviously this is where you'll go because below 100 milliseconds startup time, this is the only way. Uh, if you want to win on memory usage, let's say you have uh, an application on the JVM that takes 100 megs and you pay 100 megs a certain price and it does 50 requests per second, uh, I don't know, 50, 500, 5 million, whatever. Uh, let's say that the native image uh, has a tenth of the memory usage, but is only 90% as performant in terms of requests per second, you just add 10 of them and suddenly your, your requests per second went like 10 times higher. So, oh, not 10 times, but 90 times higher. Uh, that's, this is how you scale, this is how you win, by, by driving down the cost of memory usage on the cloud. Um, that's not very interesting. Let's talk quickly about a bit more Quarkus. Um, I talked about testing, how easy it is. As I said, I showed this earlier, you can just uh, have Quarkus test. Uh, injection is supported in the test, so you get really fast start. It's a full start as well, the entire application is running. Uh, you can mock, you can also do very easily the, run the same test against a native image. Um, I showed you the, the, the Panache uh, style of doing Hibernate, uh, which is based on active records and putting all the, the methods, all the entity methods uh, on the entity. A lot of people really prefer to have a repository pattern where you have an extra class where you put the logic in, not inside the entity but inside the repo. Uh, we support that style as well. You get exactly the same automated methods by just extending Panache repository. Um, but the drawback is that you need to inject it where you use it, so you need to get out of your function. But this is a matter of personal preference. A lot of people prefer that style. A lot of people prefer that one. You know, you can, you can pick and choose which one you want. Um, we have great support for observability through the macro profile um, uh, extensions. So open API, Swagger, UI, I showed it. We have metrics, health, we have tracing as well. Um, if you're doing messaging, which is very common in microservices, then we have you covered. We have the, the great abstraction uh, called reactive messaging. 
uh, from microprofile. You can do it in a in an imperative way, reactive way, whatever, and whatever place that you get your messages from or send them to uh, Kafka and QP, whatever, it, they're all supported. Uh, of course, security support, JWT, Keycloak, Secret Store, even if you roll your own security in properties files or your database, that's, that's supported. Um, and if you're into Spring, we also support a lot of Spring annotations, but we don't include the Spring runtime. So what we do is that we take the Spring annotations and look at your code, and then we translate it at compile time to the equivalent uh, JAXRS, uh, REST easy CDI code, uh, which means that you get exactly the same speed benefits as if you were writing it in, in the, the idiomatic way. So even if you're coding in a Spring style, you can still start, you know, benefit from the Spring experience you have and get the Spring and the speed and memory benefits that we have with, with Quarkus. So can I have, can I add my own dependencies if I'm doing a Quarkus project? The answer is always yes. Uh, you can always add your own dependencies and on the JVM it will just work. On AOT, if you're, dry, if you're compiling natively, then it may work, let's be honest. Uh, but even if it doesn't work, we can help a lot. You know, you can write your own extension um, and you can, for, for your library, and make sure that you also uh, write special code to make sure that you benefit from build time startup and, and move the configuration at build time and it's trivial to write an extension. You can help improve dead code elimination and developer joy by having, you know, better, better support for, uh, for new developers. So let's go back to the benefits I showed you. Developer joy, focus on productivity and being intuitive and nice to onboard um, developers, supersonic subatomic Java, making sure that the application is fast to start, that nobody is going to f be frustrated, uh, cheap to run on the cloud, and, and super cheap and possible and super fast for uh, serverless, uh, unification of imperative reactive style, and best of read uh, libraries and standards that everybody knows, REST-EZ, Vertex, Netty, um, and I'm done. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>